So our second example of theory is Einstein's special relativity. And we already mentioned the third example, which is, again, Einstein's general relativity, which includes not just things moving at constant speed, but also things whose speed changes or are accelerated. That's also the subject of acceleration, the subject of Newtonian mechanics. How to do it properly and to take account of gravity. Okay, that's general relativity. That's an even wider theory. So general relativity contains special relativity, which contains Newtonian mechanics. Okay. Another example, very important example of the theory, is quantum mechanics. In this course, at the end of the course, we will also learn what are the fundamental properties of the quantum world. What does quantum mechanics say? I'll just mention now that without quantum mechanics, it is impossible to understand anything about the structure of matter, about atoms, about molecules, about our bodies, anything. Okay? But if you look at what quantum mechanics says, which we will learn at the end of the course, it is extremely unusual, extremely strange in terms of our daily experience. In our daily experience, we don't see directly the results of quantum mechanics. We see them indirectly all the time because without quantum mechanics, this rule would not be hard. Okay? And the water molecules would not hold together. I mean, they would, of course, but I wouldn't understand how they do that. Okay? But what does quantum mechanics say? Quantum mechanics says little objects, particles, are at the same time both particles and waves. They have a wave nature. Electron is a wave. In fact, according to quantum mechanics, I am a wave too, and you are a wave, you have a wavelength. But my wavelength is so, so, so very small that in daily life, I never realize that any of the microscopic objects around me have any wave properties. It just doesn't show up. It's too small. Now, notice that a very powerful theory like quantum mechanics, just like relativity, can make some predictions, in fact, almost all predictions of quantum mechanics, which are extremely strange and difficult to understand and difficult to accept. Why do we accept them? Because they are, after all, tested and they explain all kinds of things, including very basic things that Newton's mechanics cannot explain. This is where a scientific theory differs from ordinary, daily, common sense. Because it's a lot more sophisticated, a lot more systematic, it can look, it can base the knowledge on experiments of the kind that you cannot do just on your own in your daily life. But nevertheless, these experiments are done by a large number of people. So, notice that a scientific theory can be strange, the things that it can it says, will somehow believe this is true with a lot of modern science. Okay. However, we don't accept it just because it's a very nice sounding theory, it's a <coughs> popular speculation. We accept it because it has been tested. Another example of such a theory is what I brought up before, evolution, okay, which is still all over the world, so much debated by the public because it's very difficult to believe what it says. And it seems to contrast some implications of religion. I say seems to. Okay? But then the question I have to ask is, has it been tested? And it has been tested many, many times, uh, in terms of the fossil record. 
And it's something that is difficult to understand because it says it talks about processes that went over hundreds of millions or billions of years. That gradually, by accumulation of very, very small changes, eventually produce unbelievably in terms of our daily experience. Big changes. Okay? But the fundamental position of this theory is that not all different kinds of living things appeared or were created or whatever separate. They are related, they have come from common ancestors a very, very long time ago. Now, we know this from, we have checked this from two different areas of evidence. The more recent one is molecular biology, which is very recent and unexpected. It developed in the 1950s. But it allows us to check molecularly the DNA. And it has, therefore, we have proof that heredity, culture, proceeds, the information proceeds from one generation to the other by this DNA, which is extremely complicated and it can have very small random mutations, as evolution predicted. Moreover, now we are able to construct the genome, whole bits of DNA of different uh, kinds of uh, living things, okay? And what happens? We find that things based on the old fossil record and based on the predictions of evolution are supposed to be closely related. If you look at their DNA, there is a big amount of overlap in the DNA. And then scientists can work from that, predict uh, how far back in time, 100 million years or whenever, these two species had a common ancestor. And this agrees what is found from the fossil record. So there's very strong evidence. Okay? So that, that makes the scientific theory in the sense that it has been verified. And it is still open to falsification, but it has not yet been falsified. Oh, it is very strong evidence. What is the difficulty uh, in the public discussion is that it seems to contradict, contradict belief. I see it seems to because religious belief or philosophical belief, is something that can be interpreted differently by different sources. So it is possible to believe religiously and to also accept the scientific theory, provided your religious belief is not interpreted by somebody literally, kelimesi kelimesi. If that is done, and if religious belief is interpreted literally as a given truth, which holds about the uh, real world, not about the spiritual world, but about the real world, physical world, biological world, if you live in, then, of course, sooner or later, there may come an experiment that shows that this literal interpretation is not true, because the experiment shows otherwise. This is what's happening with evolution. If you take a very literal belief that the world was created such and such a time ago, that all the species must have been there from the beginning as separate species, this doesn't hold against the evidence. But if you say, well, this is an interpretation, it's metaphoric, and I have my religious beliefs, but they don't say something so specific about the real world, then there's no reason why you cannot be a believer of this or that religion, or an unbeliever, whatever, and accept the results of scientific research, because the results of scientific research, after all, just refer to what is in this world. Now, a good comparison about theories is, for example, with Newton, or with Galileo. Galileo laid the foundations of how motion goes on, what is acceleration, what causes acceleration, and so on. Okay. As we know, Galileo himself faced a lot of difficulty, because what he said seemed to be, at that time, against the literal word-by-word -word interpretation of ruling dogma. We now know that that dogma was wrong, it was not the correct interpretation, whatever. Okay? But the experiment is always giving the same results. What Galileo got into trouble for was because he defended 
Copernicus. Copernicus's ideas about the solar system. He didn't even get into trouble for his own theories, but for defending Copernicus. Now we know that Copernicus is right. At the time of Galileo, when he was judged, people asked him, and they found it very difficult to believe. Not everyone, but a lot of people found it difficult to believe that the Earth moves in space around the Sun. Because our daily perception is that we are at the center and we are not moving. Okay? And again, many of the opponents, people against Galileo at the time, were perfectly reasonable. They asked him the right question. They didn't say, we refuse to believe it. They said, show us the evidence. Why do I not feel that the Earth is moving? Right? And then Galileo was able, when he first used the telescope, to show he discovered some things that he didn't even expect himself about Venus, about Jupiter, and so on. We showed that all of these things were moving around the Sun and not around the Earth. And then that convinced people. Okay. So, when a scientific theory is new, for the common public, there is a big difficulty in accepting it. And you shouldn't just discard that these people are stupid, ignorant, etc. It's not like that, because of course people want, after all, everybody thinks with common sense, okay? At least some people want to see evidence. So, if somebody says, well, it's just a theory, that is not a reasonable argument. But if somebody says, what is the evidence? That is not argument. Okay? Show me, convince me. Now, the difficulty with modern theories, like quantum mechanics, for example, Scientists know a lot about the experiments that show quantum mechanics is right. But these are not the kinds of experiments that the man or woman from the public can see for herself. Because it's about that atomic world, it's very sophisticated, the experiments are done at CERN. And then the public says, well, you know, the CERN, they will like all that. It's difficult to get across the experiments. Galileo's advantage was, at the time the technology was simple and the important experiment to show that Venus must be moving around the Sun, just took a simple telescope. And already at that time, a lot of people, a lot of cities at least, had somebody had a telescope, so people could look, it was more accessible. But quantum mechanics is not like that. Molecular biology, looking at the genome sequences and seeing how different and how similar and in what ways is a chimpanzee and a human being. This is not something that you know, everybody can test for themselves. Therefore, the public finds it difficult to believe. But you should always be very suspicious of anybody who says, don't believe this because it's just a theory. Okay. What is taken seriously in science is an argument based on what is the experiment, can you do such an experiment, what is your prediction, what is my prediction, which one will turn out to be right. Then there is a version of the argument, so and so is a very famous professor and he has done these experiments, he has written a book. And it says there, and I heard from my friend, though I read it in this professor's book, and the professor is very famous. It says there that this theory is right, this theory is wrong. Now this is not an argument either. Because you have to say, who else other than this professor has done the experiment? Okay, so it's not on the basis of authority, it's based on the practice of science as a whole. Okay? Now, after this discussion about theory, I will go back to the example at the end of the last lecture, 